Well, we want to get started off with another little video that rings with everybody. Seriously? To the cloud. What? Check it out. I pulled up the screen from our PC at home. It's like we're right there at the house. Now let's see what recorded TV we have on there. Celebrity probation. Season premiere. <laughs> Yay, cloud. To the cloud, Windows Live, to create and share anywhere. Microsoft did not pay us to do that, by the way. But everybody knows that commercial, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty good one. So I, I think that what we'll ask for, and what we'll do real quick, is just ask, does everybody know what we mean by the cloud? Does uh, anybody want to offer anything or have any uh, initial questions about what the cloud is, or are we all okay and on the same page with that? Oh, looks like we're okay. Great. Good. Good. So we'll dive right into it. So I think what we're looking at here with the cloud is that it's it's a changing world. How many people remember LPs? I actually used LPs because I remember them too, but I didn't use them. <laughs> How about eight tracks? Yeah. I I, I remember an eight tracks. I remember stuff like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in my parents' eight track when I was like three years old. We all remember cassettes, and of course CDs. And CDs are still the best audio quality you could possibly get. What happened after CDs was a, uh, a movement to kind of try to pirate the music so that we could play it on our own terms, on our phones, in some cases, or certainly our iPods, and uh, we were downloading them off of Napster or just ripping them ourselves. So what ended up happening in order to try to kind of get control of the situation, especially as Napster went offline, was Apple that came out with iTunes, a 99 cent per song model. And that worked pretty well for a long time, but honestly, that was so two years ago. Now we're doing everything off the cloud. That's still going on pretty well, but it's, it's a dying model. Today we've got Pandora, Groove Shark, Rhapsody, Last.fm, services like that that allow you to have channels of music that you're familiar with, or even the songs that you want available in the cloud. And you don't have to worry about downloading them. You don't have to buy them individually. Everything's ready for you right there. What the cloud does for us is gives us what we want now, and it gives us it gives it to us anytime, and it gives us everything we want. It's always on access to just about anything you can imagine. And if you can't imagine it, it's probably out there. And if it's not out there, it's going to be out there really soon. It's changing everything. We've got interactive websites, services, certainly apps on our phones. We're all familiar with that. Um, you can get music, obviously. We've got dining suggestions, social media, all kinds of things like that. But also, we've got a lot of business productivity that we can gain from the cloud. And mobility redefines what the cloud is for us. Yesterday, we connected with PCs, Macs, and the first generation smartphones, the Windows Mobiles, uh, which kind of helped start the, the smartphone industry. Today, we've got the newer smartphones, which is uh, uh, Blackberry, Apple's iPhone. We've got um, um, all the Android handsets, and of course, the new Windows Phone 7. We've got tablets, and we've got the next generation of netbooks running Google's Chrome OS. Tomorrow. We're going to have cars, actually that's probably going to be starting this year, um, airports, train terminals, and possibly even streets. It's, everything is starting to change. In fact, Corny's got a video on YouTube, you can check it out, about, uh, what's it called, panes of glass, I think is what it's called. Have you seen that? It, it, it's really neat, it's, it's a little pokey. But it, it's very interesting how uh, they vision the entire world made of glass and touch screens and things like that. And some of it you can actually see as being possible. So what's driving the cloud? Well, simply it's the man. For better or worse, it's here, it's here to stay, it is real. And we know that because despite its youth, it's actually not that young. How many people have heard of ASP or software as a service, things like that? They've been around for years. And really, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Cloud computing is really just rebranding. In fact, there's something going on right now called cloud washing, which is a lot of providers are kind of relabeling everything that they've already got as cloud because the term cloud computing is selling. It's selling big. So demand is driving it. Venture capitalists are driving it as well now because they kind of jumped on the bandwagon. But what makes this so unique is the fact that demand drove it first, probably after starting with mobility. Um, and it's coming from consumers and businesses, which is also a unique phenomenon. In the past, we've had bubbles. We've had um, usually just businesses or usually just consumers driving it. But now we've got both, and that's what's changing everything. It really is becoming the future of the world. So as far as business is concerned, why are businesses using the cloud? 
Well, IDC Enterprise Panel at the end of 2009 came up with these, and they still hold true for today. The top five reasons. Number one is you only have to pay for what you use. If you need something more, you add it on. If you need something taken away, just take it away. You don't need to pay for it anymore. It's easy and fast deployments for end users. It's simple just to make a phone call, add a user, your bill goes up every month. You need to, you need to shrink down a little bit, you get rid of users, the bill goes down. Monthly payments, that, that's, that's, that's the key right there. Monthly payments, there's no big outlay of cost. You simply pay for what you need, when you need it, and not, nothing more, nothing less. It also encourages standardized systems. What we've got in the case of the cloud computing, in the case of cloud computing itself, is IT people and managers, IT managers, developing the environment for you and your employees to work, rather than um, what traditionally happened, which is internal staff or internal management, which may not have the full breadth of IT training, particularly when we're talking about best practices. Also requires less in-house staff, so you can do more with less. Business use is, grow is growing. Gardner forecasts a 16% increase for businesses in cloud computing in calendar year 2011. So how are businesses using the technology of the cloud? They're using it in a variety of different ways. We're going to talk about cloud computing and networks in a minute, which is probably the, the biggest thing. Uh, but we also got storage services, being able to take a lot of the data that's on your network or at home, storing it up on storage on the internet, and being able to access it from your tablet, a bunch of different computers remotely, and it's always there. One single location, it's backed up. Roback has been around for years. Um, now it's much more common, much more prevalent, and much easier for small businesses and large businesses with various data sizes to be able to back up their data because of compression and cheaper, faster internet. Collaboration is, is huge too. SharePoint, Exchange, um, Groove, some of the Google apps. It allows businesses to be able to collaborate on the way that they weren't able to do before, at least not without significant expense. And of course social media. Everybody's jumping on social media and it's got some legitimate reasons uh, for that. But the most common way that businesses right now are leveraging the cloud is with what's called cloud computing or thin networks. And we're going to talk about that a little more in a minute. It's revolutionizing the way that businesses operate. Because instead of having to maintain everything and being completely responsible for everything, because even if you outsource your IT completely, you're still responsible, right? Instead of having to do that, it's pushed out to the cloud and someone else has to manage and maintain it. So here's a basic network diagram of a typical small business. You've got your bank of servers, you've got your PCs, your laptops, and you throw a tablet in there, and an old PC. You've got a switch, a firewall, and the cloud, the internet. You can have two internet connections, but the, the point is that it's a very basic, simple, in-house design. Everything that you need is inside the office. And you can kind of tell that uh, Microsoft developed this, this is from Visio, kind of developed their, the outlook of the cloud back in the day when they didn't quite embrace this, so it was a little dark and gloomy. Um, what you do when you move it out to the clouds, you're taking that data center and you're pushing it out here. From your perspective, as a business, is everything on your network is right here, just as it was, your PCs, everything that you touch on a day-to-day -day basis. The switch even in the firewall is there. You still need to access the internet, obviously. But everything else, the infrastructure, the servers, they're all located in the cloud. So what is this cloud anyway? Well, I didn't like that, so I went through and I found this on Google, and just, which was a little bit nicer, a little friendly. Honestly, the cloud really, it's, it's not anything different than it was when we called it an ASP, or more recently software as a service, or, or infrastructure as a service. We've got a bank of servers and a data center that's designed to handle data data servers and infrastructure and things like that. It's designed for that. So there's greater longevity, greater uptime. Uh, it's a, there's a whole uh, bank, uh, thing of uh, uh, improvements that you get with that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Virtualization is really what enables those data centers to operate. Virtualization allows us to take servers, all the servers that you have, and house them on as little as maybe just one physical box. We've got this underlying infrastructure here. We've got the hardware, the underlying infrastructure, which we call a hypervisor, and all the servers sit right on top. So in this example, we've got two servers here with four virtual machines running inside of it, and everything's seamless. And in fact, everything's secure, so secure that it's actually more secure than if it was on a single physical box. Because now, instead of someone being able to go into a server in your server closet, 
pull a hard drive out and try to recover data off of it. And you know, you know how employees can be sometimes. I would say you meet, yeah, make sure you give them grunt. Um, <laughs> instead of instead of that, we've got everything in virtual um, environments. You can't just pull a hard drive out. In fact, if anything, you might only get part of a virtual server that might not even be yours. So virtualization makes all this possible. The individual virtual machines can access resources much more effectively than a single instance of, say, even Server 2008R2, the most recent version. Because Server 2008R2 cannot access all the resources that Intel has provided on its motherboards and its CPUs. Virtualization, though, the hypervisor, that thin little program that runs right on top of the hardware, can access everything. And it allocates all those resources dynamically to the virtual machines. So even in-house, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, most of our deployments now are, are, are virtual.